First of all, big apology for not doing a live stream for surgery. I haven't been feeling too well today. Been having a fever. Anyways, I decided to give you 20 stations. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to The Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at Oscar stations in one clinical course. This is season three, episode two. We already did live streams for internal medicine and pediatrics. So if you want to learn more about that, you can jump on those streams after watching this video. Obs and gain is a plus or minus. So stay tuned for that. Tell the people that are writing obstetrics and gynecology that there may be a video also coming out. For those that are writing tomorrow so they should actually stay tuned so let's go station one a 60 year old male patient is admitted to go2 at uth with a three month history of hyperpigmented lesion of the right foot as shown in the picture what is the most likely diagnosis what are the a b c d e's of this condition what are the histomorphological types you may pause the video right now so that i give you the answer and if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel yet and don't know what you're waiting for please hit the subscribe button hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time i post and also i will be doing some live stream lectures so i don't know if you will be interested in that if you will please have a look at the community tab the, there are some details that i want to find out about the topics that you would want to learn when you would want to learn how often you will, you would want to learn those things aside the, the usual videos that are going to be showing up on the channel and um, let's get back now and see what the answer is so this is a very similar question to what is actually put out in my ultimate bazooka if you don't have that and if you're not on the telegram group I don't know if you don't follow my socials then I don't know what you want to follow so here's the answer so this is most likely a malignant melanoma remember the a b c d e's of the condition a is for asymmetry b is for the irregular borders c is for the color it's hyperpigmented d is a diameter greater than six millimeters e it has some element of elevation and it's also an evolving lesion now the subtypes are going to be your superficial spreading your nodular melanoma your acrolentigenous melanoma which is probably what this man has your lentigo malignant melanoma as well as your amelanotic melanomas moving on to station two you are attending to you are the attending doctor to a 45 year old man in casualty from chirundu with abdominal pains for three days you order the abdominal x-ray shown in the picture what is the most likely diagnosis what other questions would you ask in the history what salient features or findings might be elicited on the abdominal examination what metabolic derangements might be associated you may pause the video so as you can see from this x-ray again this is another one of those characteristic things that you either know or you don't know so this is what's known as a coffee bean sign it's very characteristic of sigmoid volvulus so this is obviously intestinal obstruction secondary to sigmoid volvulus so you'd ask for history of absolute constipation history of nausea vomiting which happens to be a late sign a history of an abdominal distension they've already given you a history of abdominal pain so you don't have to repeat that history of a hiccup or retching as well as their last meal and of course the salient features you see on examination are going to be things like an abdom distended abdomen they're going to have this tire feel like of the abdomen it feels like a tire of the abdomen when you palpate it there will be some generalized tenderness uh, there may be some rebound tenderness then the abdomen will be tympanic to percussion now the derangements that you're going to be having you're going to be having hyponatremia this already makes sense because this is a person who's vomiting and they're losing electrolytes they're going to have hypochloremia this also makes sense now because the the intestines are dying and they're releasing remember whenever cells die they release the potassium into the bloodstream so there may be some hyperkalemia when the bowel becomes infected but otherwise there, there is also going to be hypokalemia 
then of course they are also going to have a raised blood urea nitrogen in their body. Moving on to station three, a 10 year old boy presents to presents an accident and emergency department with history of four falling off a tree. Plain x-ray are shown in the picture. What is the most likely diagnosis? Outline the classification of this fracture. Mention one early and two late complications associated with this fracture. Now, I always stress on these videos that you may not necessarily get the same pictures in your exam. You may not get the same questions, but the principle always remains the same. Get the principle. If in this question they ask you about this type of fracture, which is a supracondylar fracture, think, could they sometimes bring me any other fracture? Have a look at the different types of fractures and the different classifications that you have. Another such common fracture is a coalesce fracture. So here comes the answer. So this is a supracondylar fracture of the humerus. I would want you to actually comment in the, in the comments below which type it is, which type do you think it is, whether it's type 1, type 2, or type 3. So we have a Gutland classification, type 1 where the fracture is undisplaced, type 2 where it is angulated with the posterior cortex still intact, so there's a posterior hinge. You can have a type 2A where there is a distal fragment that is angulated, it's less severe. You can have a type 2B where you have the fragments that are angulated and malrotated, this is more severe. Then of course type 3 is complete displacement. Early complications, remember that there is a big risk of injury to the brachial artery. There is a big risk of injury to the median nerve. The late complications may include things like non-union, malunion, delayed union, and in some cases, contractures. Moving on to station four, a 45-year-old patient with a three-month history of right upper or right upper high right hypochondrial pain. Current examination of the sclera is shown in the picture. What relevant questions should you ask to qualify admission to a surgical ward? What investigations might you do? Elucidate at least two hypovitaminosis which might be associated with this condition. Again, another question that is coming very similar to the bazooka. If you haven't watched, actually, if you haven't read the ultimate bazooka which has the four different courses, especially the surgery part, then I don't know what you're doing with your life. You probably should read that book. Probably all the stations because they give you the, the, the principles of how to tackle OSCE stations. So here comes the answer. So the four things that are going to be pretty much pointing us towards uh, obstructive jaundice. Remember, you have duct urine, which is pretty much attributed to conjugated bilirubin. You have pale stool because... There is no stecobilinogen, which is converted to stecobilin in the stool. And of course, it will be foul-smelling and fatty because bile isn't there to emulsify the fat and absorb the fat. Then they may have itchy skin because of the deposition of the uh, bile salts in the skin. Then, of course, right upper quadrant pain is they've already given us that, so you can actually scratch that out. Then, of course, abdominal, uh, actually, investigation, rather, that you would order are things like abdominal ultrasound. You should order some blood investigations such as 5 prime nucleotidase, serum bilirubin, CA19 stroke 9 if you're suspecting uh, pancreatic cancer, serum AST and ALT, ALP, GGT, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatograph, magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatograph, CT scan. Remember, do not write abbreviations in your exam, write them in full. Then, of course, remember that the vitamins that are going to be affected are pretty much your fat soluble vitamins, ADEC, vitamin A, D, E, and K. If they have a vitamin A deficiency, they may present you with blindness, night blindness. If they have a vitamin D deficiency, maybe osteomalacia, they may have pathological fractures. If it's a vitamin E deficiency, they're going to have poor wound healing. Then if it's a vitamin K deficiency, they're going to be having bleeding disorders. Moving on to station four, a 20-year-old male patient presents with acute onset of abdominal pain after ingestion of a snack bought at a local supermarket. And intraoperative findings are shown in the picture. What is the likely diagnosis? Outline the parameters in the Alvarado. This is supposed to be Alvarado, not Alvarado. Alvarado score. What two complications might be associated with this condition? You may pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So most likely this is 
an acute appendicitis. So this is a ver the vermiform appendix that, that is shown in the picture. This is an acute appendicitis. Now remember the alpha score is also referred to as the Montrell's. So you can use the mnemonic Montrell to help remember the, the clinical features. So the first M is for migratory pain. So this pain migrates from the umbilicus to the right iliac fossa. The, so you, they give them a score of one. The A is for anorexia, you give them a score of one. The N is for nausea and vomiting, you give them a score of one. The T is for tenderness, you give them a score of two. The R is for rebound tenderness, you give them a score of one. The E is for elevated temperature, uh, that's a temperature greater than 37.3 you give them a score of one as well. Then of course you have leukocytosis greater than 10,000, as well as a shift towards your neutrophils. Then you add the scores together. If the score is less than five, okay, you're not so sure if that is appendicitis. If it is five to six, it's compatible. If it's six to nine, it's probable. If it's nine to 10, it is confirmed. Now the two complications could be, this could, uh, pretty much leads to perforation, intestinal obstruction rather, and then perforation, which could lead to peritonitis, you could have septicemia, appendicular mass, appendicular abscess, pelvic abscess, and even gangrene. Moving on to station five, a 27-year-old gym trainer from Kawata presents in clinic at UTH with a reducible left inguinoscrotal swelling, as shown in the picture. What is the most likely diagnosis? What state four risk factors associated with this condition? What are the complications of the above condition? You may pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So this is most likely a complete inguinoscrotal hernia. And I'll show you the, the risk factors in the next slide, but the complications could be due to the conditions such as strangulation of the bowel, that's cutting off the blood supply, that could lead to infarction, it could lead to gangrene, it could lead to peritonitis, and then the bowel itself could be obstructed, so they could have an intestinal obstruction. Then the complications that are due to the, the procedure that repairs it is things like hemorrhage and hematoma formation, acute urinary retention, hematocils, you could have post hernia hydrocils, you may have a lymphocil, you may have injury to the ilioinguinal nerve leading to chronic pain, you may have testicular pain and swelling, infections and even hyperesthesia on the middle or rather medial side of the inguinal canal. This is also due to injury to the iliohypogastric nerve. So the risk factors, remember the things that are going to be increasing intra-abdominal pressure, so straining, lifting heavy weights, con chronic constipation, so it could be habitual or even due to things like rectal strictures, chronic coughs, things like TB, chronic bronchitis, bronchial asthma, even COPDs like emphysema. And of course, it could be you know, it causes like old age in, in the case of thinking uh, BPH, benign prosthetic hyper, hypertrophy, as well as carcinoma prostate. Then it could be in the young, it could be due to strictures of the urethra. In the very young, it could be due to phimosis, even neatal stenosis, even ascites. Then it could be due to some wall weaknesses it's seen in obesity, the pregnancy in the pelvic anatomy, especially in femoral Henias in females, but then that, that was a male, so we don't regard this. This is just in general. Then, of course, it could be due to smoking, previous surgeries like an appendectomy at the Mac, when you do a McBurney's incision, you may actually injure the ilio inguinal nerve, and this can actually cause a right sided direct inguinal hernia. Some individuals have uh, familial collagen disorders like prune belly syndrome, and then they may have acquired herniation which is probably due to collagen deficiencies that are referred to as a metastatic emphysema of Reed. Moving on to station seven, a 36 year old patient presented to the, uh, to the accident and emergency department with a history of being hit by a motor vehicle. You examine her pupils and findings are as shown in the picture. What sign is being demonstrated? What two important questions would you ask in the history? Mention three indications for doing CT in this patient. What could be the CT finding? What anatomical pathology could be responsible for the sign elicited in the picture? Okay, so pause, take your time, pause the video. I know you may not have seen this on the channel before, but 
you can you can take your time so here comes the answer so this before i give you let me give you a background remember that when you shine light into the eye it's supposed to constrict normally if you see that one people is constricted in daylight and the other one is not constricted these are referred to as unequal pupils so you refer to this as anisocoria so this woman probably has anisocoria so the important things that you want to ask on the history if there was any history of loss of consciousness if there was any history of convulsions if she was bleeding from the ears or the nose of course if there's any history of increased intracranial pressure things like nausea projectile vomiting and even headaches then of course the three indications that we would want to look out for the, the unequal pupil itself is a focal sign so we should get a ct scan if there's any confusions or seizures if there's any history of loss of consciousness we should get the ct scan and of course the ct finding i had a bit of some debate in in my mind and a, and, a, and a battle in my mind as to pick what exactly you would see on the ct scan so most likely you may see an intraparenchymal hemorrhage or a hematoma now i want to pose a question to you viewers and i want you to comment in the section below where do you think the lesion is on the left side or on the right side and why then again when it comes to the anatomical pathology so this could either be due to compression of the brainstem of course, this is affecting the Edinger Westphal nucleus, uh, or it could be due to uh, a cranial nerve 3 palsy, but then, or uh, rather, uh, compression of the cranial nerve 3, not a cranial nerve 3 palsy, compression of the cranial nerve 3. But then that would also be associated with some degree of ptosis, of which we don't really see in this question. But part of her, her upper eyelid, actually, when you look at it, the eyebrow looks rather swollen. It could also be due to trauma actually but anyways it's most likely that this person had compression in the brainstem affecting the uh, superficial para parasympathetic fibers or the third cranial nerve or they could have asymmetrical inhibition of the edinger westphal nucleus which is the nucleus that mediates the light reflex to cause the pupil to constrict moving on to station eight a five-month-old baby presents to the pediatric surgical unit as a referral from chitokoloki mission hospital for further management what is the most likely diagnosis what sign is being demonstrated mention two types of this condition on examination what are the likely findings mention one treatment modality in surgery you may pause the video right now and here comes the answer this is a very familiar one so this child is hydrocephalus so the, the sign is more or less a sunset eyes, though not really a typical one, but you can kind of make it out. So it's a sunset eyes. Like the, the, you can see that the iris here is almost like setting into the lower eyelids. So the two types are obstructive type of hydrocephalus and non-obstructive type of hydrocephalus. On examination, you may hear a crackpot sound on percussion. You may palpate the sutures being split apart. There can be an increase, in, there will be an increase in the circumference of the head as well. As you may notice, some dilated scalp vessels. One treatment modality is, of course, we shunt. So we can use different types of shunts. We may have a, a ventricular osseous, ventricular peritoneal, a ventricular atrial, okay, and ventricular um, pleural. Many different shunts that you can actually use. Moving on to station nine, a uh, twenty. A four-year-old RTA victim presents to the emergency and accident department with dyspnea. A clinical officer orders a chest x-ray as shown in the picture. What does the chest x-ray show? What are the salient features to elicit on examination? What immediate intervention would you do? What is the definitive treatment of this patient? So you may pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So as we can see on the the, this is this is the, the right side. This is not supposed to be the left side. So let me just correct this and say this is the right side. Okay, so let me just correct this right now. So this is the right side. So as you can see on the right side, where the arrow is actually facing, you have loss of um, the pulmonary markings. You have visualization of the pleura on the right side. This is consistent with the right-sided pneumothorax, of course, with a collapsed lung. You also have deviation of the trachea to the left side. So... The salient features you would actually elicit on when you examine this patient, you may see a trail sign on the left side. You may see the tracheal deviation to the left when you palpate. You may get hyper resonance on the right side of the uh, thorax. You may also reduce air entry 
on the right side. So the the measure that we actually do as first aid to help this patient, the immediate measure is what is known as a needle thoracostomy. So we get a large bore cannula, then we palpate the clavicle and we go in just underneath mid-clavicular into the second intercostal space, then we put it inside there until we feel a pressure, then a giving and a hiss of air passing out. Then of course your definitive management is of course placement of an intercostal chest drain. Moving on to station 10, a 25-year-old presented to the hospital with acute abdomen and intraoperatively a gangrenous sigmoid colon was found. And so the picture um, shows the patient. What does the image show? What type is it? Generally mention three indications for this procedure. What three complications are associated with this procedure? You may actually pause the video. And here comes the answer. So already keep in mind that this patient here was going to operation. They had some form of gangrene. So this is this is um, a mucocutaneous fistula, an iatrogenic mucocutaneous fistula. So we can call it as a left-sided colostomy. So the type of colostomy is of course a double barrel. It looks like a double barrel because you have two openings. I don't know if this, what I'm making out here seems to be the opening. You have an opening here and another opening there. Okay, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems more or less like a double barrel colostomy. Then the three indications of this procedure are going to be things like tumors of the uh, anal canal and the rectum, penetrating trauma of the uh, bowel on the left side, intestinal obstruction, obviously that's due to sigmoid volvulus. Then the three complications could be that the, the stoma could retract, there could be prolapse, there could be parastomal hernias, there could be stenosis. Moving on to station 11, which is a giveaway for, for sure, according to my opinion, for each of the following ulcer, state the type of edge and give an example for each one of them. Okay, so you may pause the video. I know you have seen these things, you've seen these diagrams. If you have read before or if you have passed through a surgical department, you have an idea of what this is. Okay, so here comes the answer. So the first one that's labeled one is known as a sloping edge. So that's seen in a healing ulcer. The second one is known as a punched out edge that is seen in syphilis. The third one is known as an undermined edge that is seen in tuberculosis. The fourth one is known as a raised or beaded edge, which is seen in a basal cell carcinoma. And the fifth is known as an everted edge, which is seen in the squamous cell carcinoma of the scalp. Moving on to station 12, a 60-year-old retired teacher presented to the specialist clinic for a three-month history of uh, breast swelling. What is the most likely diagnosis? Itemize four risk factors you would elicit in the history. Mention three common drugs used in a neoadjuvant therapy apart from clinical assessment. What are the other two modes of assessment to complete the triple assessment. You may pause the video right now and here comes the answer. So this woman here has breast cancer. The, the sign that's actually shown here more or less looks like a pore d'orange or the there is also some dimpling that, that is rather a dimpling of the nipple that is evident but it looks more or less like a pore d'orange though the, the picture is not so clear. So they are pretty much non-modifiable risk factors and modifiable risk factors. The, the non-modifiable risk factors include things like age. Of course, it's very common in postmenopausal people. Genetics, the two most important mutations you need to worry about are the, the breast uh, cancer, or the BRCA gene, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Then of course you have early menarche and late menopause, which is indicative of prolonged estrogen exposure. You have modified risk, modifiable risk factors such as obesity because of the estrogen. Remember that fat cells can produce a type of estrogen that's known as estron. Naliparity and even multiparity, estrogen-based contraceptives. And of course three drugs include a pacritaxel, which are taxins. You have anthracyclines like doxorubicin, you have 5-fluorouracil, cyclophosphamide, and even carboplatin, which can be used as neoadjuvant therapy. And of course, remember the triple therapy is we're going to be taking a clinical assessment, which is pretty much our history and physical examination, radiological assessment, which is pretty much mammogram. This woman is above the age of 35. If she were below the age of 35, we use an ultrasound. 
and of course histological examination which is your fine needle aspiration or your true cut biopsy so it's radiological assessment and histological assessment station 13 what is shown in the picture what is the indication in this case what complications can arise from this treatment you may pause the video right now and here comes the answer so most likely this is external fixation it is seen with a complete uh, displaced fracture of the tibia it probably was an open fracture as you can see here there is some suturing that you can see very closely there so the complications include over destruction for example where the over destruction where there is no proper contact between the fracture segments and this can actually lead to non-union you can have pin tract infections you may have damage to the soft tissue structures when inserting these pins station 14 a 35 year old patient presented to clinic 7 at uth for passing blood in urine what investigation is this what is your diagnosis what four questions would you ask in the history mention two further investigations that can be done in this patient you may pause the video right now and here comes the answer so this is most likely an intravenous urogram x-ray and we can see this filling defect here this is where the bladder is supposed to be this appears like as if there's a mass here so this is most likely a, a bladder stone or bladder calculi so the four questions you would ask on the history if there's a history of frequency if there's a history of urgency if there's a sudden termination of voiding which is associated with pain that radiates to the tip of the penis the scrotum the perineum the back or the hip and this pain is going to be relieved by the soup, by getting to the supine position or being prone or even lateral position with the head down then even if they have suprapubic pain dysuria hesitance nocturia or urinary retention it's most likely that they have urinary stones so the other two investigations you could do you could do a cystoscopy you could do a ct scan you may do urine a microscopic culture sensitivity you may even do a urinalysis station 15 a 40 year old man presents with a darkening of the toes in the background of smoking for over 10 years what is the diagnosis what relevant questions would you ask in the history what three investigations would you carry out how would you treat how would you treat it you may pause the video right now and here comes the answer so this looks like this person has acute limb ischemia now i want you to comment in the section below whether you think this is rather a dry type of gangrene or a wet gangrene i am very interested because i had uh, some arguments over this question so i really want to you to find out or to know from you if this is dry gangrene or wet gangrene please let me know in the comment below then so you want to ask for a history of diabetes mellitus and dvt actually this picture actually was a patient that had um, a diabetic foot so i think it's most likely that wet gangrene would be more likely you could even see the edema beyond anyways a history of diabetes mellitus a dvt you also would need a history of um, ask for a history of chest pain shortness of breath tachypnea or breathlessness which could indicate a pulmonary embolism history of trauma history of lower limb swelling history of fever and of course the things that you're going to be looking for investigations you would look for your d-dimers that will show you that there was a blood clot a doppler ultrasound to show you if there's any blockage and of course a full blood count and a differential how you treat this uh, broad spectrum antibiotics give them aspirin analgesia as well as limb elevation and of course amputation moving on to station 16 a 65 year old man is brought to the emergency ward with history of being burnt with hot water to the entire back what three relevant questions would you ask in the history calculate the fluid this is supposed to be question two um, calculate the fluid required to be given in 24 hours mention two early complications which might be associated with this patient and take note the said early complication so you may pause the video right now and here comes the answer so you would want to ask the time this person was burnt 
because this is very important for giving the fluids, the circumstance in which this person was burnt, um, when the how the injury happened, how did they get the hot water spilled on them? Then, of course, what first aid was offered to the patient? Mm -hmm. Now, remember that the way we're going to be calculating the fluids is pretty much using our Parkland formula, which is equal to four mils multiplied by the body weight multiplied by the burn percentage. And remember that here we're using the rule of nines because it's an adult. Remember that the back, the entire back is going to be accounting for 18%. So four multiplied by 65 multiplied by 18, which gives you something roughly around 4,618 mils. Then the two early complications, <coughs> excuse me, you remember that hypothermia is a very huge risk. Hypovolemia is also another huge risk. So they could have hypothermia, they could have hypovolemic shock. Station 17, a 48-year-old woman was admitted to the surgical ward for anterior neck swelling, which could move with swallowing and she underwent surgery. What is the most likely diagnosis? Why does the mass move with swallowing? Mention three investigations you would do. What are the indications for surgery? You may pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously a goiter. You, just by looking at her, most likely you could say that this woman has a hyperthyroid goiter. Because she looks rather sweaty, but you can't really commit to that. So she, most likely she's, it's just a goiter. So the reason why the goiter moves is remember that the thyroid is attached to the cartilage of the larynx by a ligament which is known as the suspensory ligaments of Barry or Barry's ligaments. Now the three investigations you would actually order include your thyroid function tests, that's your T3, T4, TSH, your ultrasound of the thyroid, and as well as a lateral neck x-ray and, and even a chest x-ray. You may also order for a fine needle aspiration and cytology. Then what are the indications for surgery? It could be due to cosmesis, could be due to malignancy, could be due to compression symptoms like dyspnea, dysphonia, or dysphagia. Station 18, a 40-year-old female with dysphagia to liquids only has undergone this investigation and the image is displayed. What investigation was done and what sign is it showing? What is the most likely diagnosis? What two other questions would you ask the patient? Mention two other investigations you can do in this patient. You may pause the video. I know you have seen this a couple of times. So this is obviously a barium swallow and it's going to be showing a bird beak appearance or your rat tail sign. Then this is seen in achalasia cardia. So the two questions you would ask for a duration of the dysphagia or if there's any associated pain, your old dinophagia, or your regurgitation of food, if there's any nausea or vomiting. And of course, note that the dysphagia for the liquids first has already been asked. So this person already has dysphagia for liquids, so there's no need to ask that again. The two investigations you want to do an esophagoscopy as well as a lower esophageal manometry to determine the pressures at the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, station 19 are pretty much cysts, which you should identify from 1 going through to 5. So this also is very, very familiar in the different ultimate bazooka that I have released before. Of course, in the Telegram group. So station 1 is a cystic hygroma. Station 2 is a ganglion cyst. Station 3 is a dermoid cyst. Station 4 is a sebaceous cyst. And station 5 is a thyroglossal cyst. So those are the different types of swellings and what they are. Just keep them in mind. The, the dermoid cysts usually tend to be at the corner of the eyes. The ganglion cysts usually tend to be at the back of the, the hands. The cystic hygromas are in the neck, usually in children. Then, of course, same thing with um, your thyroglossal cyst, midline neck mass in children. And then sebaceous cysts can be found on the scalp. Now, the last question, I saved the best for last because there's going to be a big argument here, but I've done my research, I've done some reading, and I'll give you my two cents about this question. So a 35-year-old RTA victim presents to the adult emergency with a BP of 60 over 40 and a pulse of 140. You intend to resuscitate the patient. Which of the two cannulae will you put and what size is it? Between Ringer's lactate and normal saline, which fluid would you want to give and why? This is a question that's going to be causing a lot of havoc. You instruct the nurse to give you to give 600 mils of Ringer's 
lactate over 30 minutes using a given set that delivers 20 drops per minute. How many drops per minute should she set the fluid? Okay. So I think partly they have given you the answer in this question. But anyways, I know that most of you are going to be going for the green cannula because that's what you see on the words. But no, remember if you're resuscitating according to your advanced trauma life support, you're going to be using your large bowl cannulae. Large bowl cannulae is your 16G or your 14G. The 16G is the gray cannula. Remember that the green cannula is 18G. So use the gray cannula, the 16G. And you're going to be starting off three ringers like this. I know most of you are going to be saying, no, why not normal cell line? No. Here's the reason why. So research has shown that um, normal cell line is actually much inferior to ringers lactate in terms of resuscitation. Why? It's because normal cell line has a vasodilatory effect in the systemic blood vessels to begin with. The second thing is that normal cell line also has a risk of metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia. Now, remember that um, ringers lactate also has sodium lactate within it. Now remember that this sodium lactate can be metabolized to form bicarbonate and the bicarbonate can actually help with the acidotic states that the patient may be in, especially those patients that are hypotensive. And when you give normal cell line, on the other hand, it has a high level of chloride. Remember that the high level of chloride, if it's given in high amounts, it can actually cause vasoconstriction of the renal arteries and cause impairment of the renal blood flow, which is why ringers lactate is much more superior, which even leads you in the next question the nurse actually, you decide, you instruct the nurse to give Ringer's lactate. So remember how you calculate the drops per minute. You say the total volume that you're supposed to give in mils divided by the total time that you're supposed to give in minutes. So if I have given you now is you should change that to minutes, then multiply by the drop factor. In this case, our mils is 600 mils. We give it in 30 minutes. So 600 divided by 30, that gives you 20. 20 multiplied by your drop factor of 20 drops per minute, that will give you 400 drops per minute. So this should be 400 drops per minute. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode of The Bazooka. If you did, please drop a like, drop a comment, show some support, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, tell a friend to tell a friend that exam week is almost concluding on the channel. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.